what a great day. Thanks for being here today, and I, I hope we'll have a great time in God's Word this morning. Does anybody here ever recall seeing an advertisement for uh, the Charles Atlas bodybuilding program? Do you, you re ever rem remember that? In some of the magazines I read as a child or a young person, I remember seeing those. And it, 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 if you don't know anything about Charles Atlas, before Arnold Schwarzenegger was a bodybuilder and, and the, the cyborg on Terminator and those kind of things, there was this guy named Charles Atlas. And he was actually born around the turn of the, 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 the century before this one. And, and so he, he was, he, he developed this system really with no, no, no weights. It was a, more like an isometric bodybuilding program. And anyway, I, rec I recall seeing these comic book type drawings of this little 97 pound weakling guy named Mac and he's on the beach and some big dude comes up and kicks sand in Mac and his girlfriend's face and Mac's really upset. And the, the big guy says, well, you're such a scrawny little guy, I'm not even gonna do anything to you because I, I basically push you and you tip over. So Mac says, I'm gonna get strong. And, and he goes and he starts doing uh, the Charles Atlas program and he gets, he gets bigger and, 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 and gone are the days of being humiliated before the girls because he's this scrawny little dude. And, and, and you know, I was thinking about that, that this week and, and, and I tell you that to say this, what the Charles Atlas body program was to 97 pound guys like Mac, Christian apologetics is for some of the spiritually insecure in the body of Christ. Now, I love apologetics, and, and so I'm not here to denigrate apologetics. And if you don't know what apologetics is, let, let me just explain it to you this way. It's a, it's a branch of the Christian the theological system that, that focuses on giving a defense or, or providing a rational answer for what Christians believe. It's based on 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, uh, depending on what translation you have, uh, my, my New King James says, "Be but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense. And that's the word apologia. Give a defense for, for the faith uh, to, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear or with gentleness and reverence. So apologetics is about filling in the potholes and, 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 and moving the impediments that exist that keep people from coming to faith in Christ. But, but our hope is never supposed to be in apologetics or philosophy. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Apologetics has its place, but it's, it, it, it's for some people becomes a substitute for actually trusting in the Lord. And it's, it's almost like a, a, a defensive system that they use to shield themselves from public humi humiliation. And, and so I, I, I bring that up just, just, to, say, just to say this. I, I understand why people would, would, would feel that way, but, but, but I think one of our best apologetics is not what we say, but it's how we live. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I really believe that the most influential apologetic or characteristic we can bring into this world is to live a life of love toward one another and, and to, do, to do all we can to maintain unity in the, in the body of Christ. Now, I, it's tough out there. I, I, I know it is. I've, I've tried to bring Christ into some dark places. I've done open-air preaching uh, on, on college campuses. I've gone down to the, the, the bar streets that were, where the guys and gals are coming out of the taverns, and they're looped up, and I've tried to preach the gospel open-air there. I've done door-to-door track distribution, cold turkey witnessing on the streets of Milwaukee. I've done a lot of different things. I know, I know when Jesus said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, there's something to that. It, it, it can be really tough out there. But I also want you to know that, that if we go out with a spirit of love, we can be influential because I believe that one of our best and most influential apologetics is how we treat each other. Amen? If we know how to treat each other, and we consistently let God flow through us as we lean on him, good things can happen. So, so those two powerful areas are what I want to start looking into this morning. John, John 13 is the first place I'd like you to join with me in turning. John 13, 34 and 35. And, and we're going to look at John 13, 34. We're going to see what Jesus said about the importance of, of our love for one another. And then we're going to look over at John 17 for a few minutes, but we're going to really occupy ourselves with, with what Jesus is saying here in John 13. John chapter 13, 
Begin, beginning at verse 33, he says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and I, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So that's that first aspect I was talking about, the importance of love. But then over in John chapter 17, John chapter 17, verses uh, 20 through 23, Jesus says in John 17, 20, I do not pray, this is his high priestly prayer, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are, we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may, may, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved me, or have loved them as you have loved me. So in both of those verses, there was reference made to others knowing something about the reality of Christ based on what they saw in, in believers. Over in John 13, uh, it, 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 in verse 35, it says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then in John 17, verses 21 and 23, verse 21 says that the world may believe and then verse 23, that the world may know that you have sent me. There's a lot riding on how we re relate and behave toward one another. I believe our greatest apologetic, our most influ influential demonstration of the reality of Christ's presence in our lives is our love for one another and our commitment to unity. So just in the, in the, in the moments that we have remaining, I'd like to explore that, but I, I'm going to reach out to the Lord in prayer one, one more time. Father, we want to be people who love well. There's a lot of things we could be good at, but uh, I'm, I'm convinced that if we can love well, if we know how to walk with you and lean into you, that great things can happen in the lives of the people that, that, that observe us. And, and so, Lord, as we're here, here today seeking you through your word, Holy Spirit, we're trusting you to empower us and, and, and guide us into the truth. Help us to live in such a way that the world will know that, that you're real in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the importance of Christians demonstrating love for one another is, is that Jesus said, by this you, they'll know that you're my disciples if you have love. Did you see the word if? If means it's, it's not something that will necessarily happen. We have to do something. It's a conditional clause. If means that, that we do our part, then God's goal will come to pass. Francis Schaeffer called this the mark of the Christian. And down through the years since Christ came, men have tried to use other ways to identify themselves as Christians. Lapels, lapel pins, crosses, certain kind of haircuts. And, and all that might be good, but, but Jesus already knew that there was a better way. And the better way is that Christians would actually walk in love with one another. This is the universal mark that Jesus gave that, that, can, that can empower all Christians to, to, to really be identifiable as, as his followers. Well, last week we, we, we spent time in the Samaritan, uh, the Good Samaritan story, Luke chapter 10. And, and there we saw God saying, we should love our neighbors. And, and who was our neighbor? Anybody who had a need that we had the capacity or the ability to, to touch or influence was our neighbor. And, and, and really the lesson in that is that all people, because they are fellow image bearers, have value to God. And they should have value to us as well. There's no one who's made in the image of God that, that's insignificant or unimportant. They all matter to God. Well, here in John 13, Jesus is addressing his disciples. And the emphasis here is, is, is on having a special love for Christians, a special love for those who claim to be followers of Jesus. Now, now I, I don't know if this is confusing to anybody or not. You know, does it seem like a, 
a contradiction that we're supposed to love our neighbor, but then we're also supposed to also supposed to love Christians a little bit better. It, it, it seems a, a little strange, but over in Galatians six, verse nine, it's it, it, it talks about the same thing. Galatians six nine, Paul says, "Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart or do not give up." Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You see that emphasis? It's the same one that, that I'm talking about this morning. The Good Samaritan's message was, love your neighbor, love everybody. But here Paul is saying, he adds to it, especially those who are of the household of faith. Well, you know, I think we really need to embrace the, 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 the confidence that when God calls us to do something, he empowers us to do it as well. When, when God says, this is what I want you to do, he will give us the, the ability to pull it off. And, 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 and I think it's important for us to, 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 to really take that one to the, to the bank because as our world grows more and more lawless, I think our tendency is to want to withdraw and say, you know, that's on them. They've got their problem. I've got my little, own little world to take care of, and, and I'm going to just kind of withdraw and protect myself. But, but as I read this, I don't think that's an option. The death of our civilization might tempt us to get more cynical and become more self-protective, but, but, but I, I, I really think that uh, what, what Christ is calling us to is, is to continue to follow him. And it, it's interesting. He says I, I, it's a new commandment. In what way is this a new commandment? We just read it last week, right? L love, love God and love your, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the word new here speaks of, 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 a, of a renewed or refreshed or a re-emphasized or highlighted emphasis. And, and, and this renewed commandment to operate in love is the most powerful sign of, of our Christian faith. Jesus said by it, everyone would be able to determine if we were real Christians or not. That's, that's pretty significant, isn't it? You know, it's, 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 it's I guess the best, way, the, the way I thought was the best way to think about it is this. When someone doesn't know the Lord, there are certain things that you can pretty much expect will eventually come out of their lives, right? If someone's drawing all of their strength from what they have in, in their bankrupt spiritual reserves, it's, it's predictable what's going to happen. And, and Paul wrote about this in Titus chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, where he talks about what people were like before they became Christians. And, 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 and he says in Titus 3.3, 3, he says, We ourselves once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving lusts, various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. What a description. Paul says before people come to Christ, before this group of people that he was writing to or, or writing about in Crete, where, where Titus was serving, he says before they became Christians, they, they were filled with malice and envy, and they were hateful and hating each other. That's what we should expect out of lost people. They don't have a connection with Christ. They don't have spiritual bank accounts that they can draw from and say, Lord, help me to love. They're doing it in their own strength. Some of them do it pretty well for not having Jesus in their lives, don't they? I, I've met some pretty nice non-Christians. I really have. But what Jesus is talking about here isn't Minnesota nice or, or being hospital, hospitable or polite. He says, love as I loved you. That, that, that raised the bar significantly. As, as that passage goes on in Titus chapter 3, Paul goes on and explains that the, the, the Christian, through the new birth, has the potential for great change in the way that he or she would live. Titus 3 verse 4 it says, When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. I don't know if you caught the the, the potential uh, potential that was inherent in those strings of uh, interventional words that, that Paul used to describe salvation. He said God saved us, he regenerated us, he renewed us by the Holy Spirit, 
whom he poured out abundantly. You see, God gives us an abundance. He's generous. And he poured out his spirit on us. And, and, and the regenerating and renewing work of the spirit in the life of those who trust in Christ isn't just a little sprinkle. It, it, it's talking about a, a river of, of life and abundance. Jesus, Jesus said those who believe in him out of their inner being would flow rivers of living water, an endless supply. We're talking supernatural stuff, right? That's the life God wants you to live. That's why I included that song, learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I ever dreamed. But sometimes we don't find that power because we never come to the end of ourselves. We keep trying to do it in our own strength. Over in Romans 5.5, 5, Paul says, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom God has given us. Those are resources we need to learn to live by. And, and, and we, ne we need to learn how to trust and tap into those kind of things. You, you know, sometimes Christians find themselves very much alone in, in, the, in this world. I, I don't know if, you, if that's been your experience or not, but, but when, sometimes when some people come to Christ, their families c shut them out. Maybe they lose their job because they were involved in something that was kind of dubious or questionable, and they, they say, wow, I, I, can't, I can't keep uh, selling my body or selling drugs or whatever it was I was doing to make a living before. I, I've got to take a new path. And once they embark on that path, their world changes dramatically. They lose their friends. They lose their support system. You know where they're supposed to find a family? In the body of Christ. I was so thrilled when I heard Richard was teaching on the one another passages in Sunday school. That's part of what it means to be the body. There are multiple one another passages that if we would reflect on, we'd say, of course that makes sense. You know, I, I read this week about a man named Mark Knutson who was diagnosed with an extremely aggressive form of cancer. He knew he was gonna die. He wasn't that afraid for himself because he was a Christian. What he was afraid of was he had a wife and little children that he was leaving behind. So he started talking to people in his church and, 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 and a few days later, the Knutson family heard a bunch of noise outside their house. You know, you, know what, you know what was happening? The street was filled with their Christian friends who had gathered to, to, to form hands and encircle that house and they prayed for them. And, and, and then they began to do whatever they could in the weeks that came to support and strengthen and help Mark's, help Mark's wife and kids to, to deal with the, the fact that Mark was dying. And, and, and even though Mark was too ill to have visitors come in and talk to him, the, the, those people for the next six weeks continued to love on his family. And, and, and uh, they, they did all kinds of practical, practical stuff. And, 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 and as a result of this, you know what? Some of Mark's neighbors uh, turned to Christ. They said, wow, if that's what it means to be part of the family of God, I'm in. I want that kind of friendship, those kind of supports. And Mark's family experienced what, it, what it's like to be part of the family of God. In fact, on Wednesday night, Richard's been leading us and singing a song. I'm so, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Are you glad you're part of the family of God? Have you ever been deeply touched and ministered to by God's people? I have. It's, it's, it's beautiful when the body of Christ steps in to fill a need that, that really can be met in, 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 in the best way by a spirit-filled person who has the mind of Christ, insight into someone's spiritual, spiritual condition, and who wants to be a conduit of his grace and his love. I, I read a story about a boy who, after his dad had died, had to go to work to support his mom and his sister. And the job he found was in another community, and, and to... to to make things easier, he just uh, started living with his two, two elderly aunts and, 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 and bachelor uncle. Well, one of the aunts was a Baptist, the other aunt was a Presbyterian, and the uncle was a non-believer. He didn't go to church anywhere. So on Saturday night, the uncle would go out and do what uh, a hard-living, uh, drinking man would do, and he'd, he'd, he'd go to his church, <laughs> the bar, and, 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 and drink till late in, late in the night and then Sunday morning would come and he'd sleep in and then he'd get up at, at about noon and he'd have Sunday dinner with the two sisters who went to church well the two sisters would come home from church 
and, and, and they would have grilled pastor as they picked on the pastor's sermons and things like that. And then, and then they would, for, for hors d'oeuvres, they, they'd pick on the, the things that they heard about people in church and they'd gossip about what, you know, this juicy tidbit and that juicy tidbit. And, and, and uh, that went on for quite a while. Well, eventually the young man grew up and, and he actually went into ministry. And, and then late, later on, his uncle was very sick and in the hospital. And one of the elderly aunts said to him, why do you think my brother won't turn to Christ? And, and the pastor said, he had to bite his tongue. He wanted so much to confront his sister, but out of, or, or his aunt, but out of respect for her, he, he didn't. But this is what he said. He said, in hindsight, it was so clear to him that we won't win the lost by being Christian cannibals. Christian cannibal? What does that mean? He, he's, he's, he, then he quoted Galatians 5.15. He said, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you're not consumed one of another. You see, when the unsaved see us bickering and fighting and picking on each other, they say, I don't need that. I, I got that every day of the week, seven days a week in, in, in my house, in my job. When they hear gossip before the gospel, they, they're not interested. You see, the most important thing we can do as Christians is to walk in love. I, I'm, I'm excited about truth. I love truth. But the Bible says, speak the truth in love. If you can't include and, and, and undergird and support everything in love, you're missing the mark. God help us if we're no different than the world. And like the people Paul described in Titus 3, if we're just serving various lusts and pleasures and living in malice and envy and hate, hateful and hating one another, we're not going to have much of an influence on the world. In fact, we're, we're going we're to reinforce the idea that the, the, the many non-Christians have is that there's nothing happening here that, that, they, that they need. Well, we know differently. We know the Savior is real. And, and, and you know, as we, as we live and work together as Christians, I've discovered this. It's inevitable that we're going to say and do things that hurt each other, right? We are also imperfect. It's not that, it's not that we're not going to hurt each other and, it, and that trouble isn't going to at times happen. It's how we deal with it that matters. It's inevitable that we'll say and do things that annoy or disappoint or, 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 or just bother each other. But do we then let it become a, a point of uh, broken fellowship? And do we harbor bitterness and resentment? Listen, listen to these powerful words from Ephesians 4 that Paul wrote. He said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of of edifying or building people up that, that it may minister grace to the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That's what God calls us to. The standard is so high because the price that was paid was so infinitely high. Christ died for us. And he's saying, if I could die for you and sacrifice so much, don't you think you could offer some grace and kindness to each other? You know, sometimes we, we reach points where we just feel like, you know, I just can't let this certain thing go. I, I was hurt so deeply, I, I, I just can't let it go. Do you know God has a strategy for that? If we've been hurt deeply, the Bible says that it's, on us to go to the one who offended us. We shouldn't wait for them to come because if they've offended us, chances are they weren't really listening to the Lord or they were just kind of going in a strange, maybe a fleshly direction. And, and God's goal is that they would be restored or reconciled to himself. And so if we really love people, we'll want, to, we'll want them to be restored to God and as much as possible restored to us too. And that's why in Matthew 18, verse 15, it says, if your brother sins against you, go. Tell him. Tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. You restore the relationship and you say, I'm so glad we're, we're connecting again. Shake hands, hug, we go on. But if they've offended you, they hurt you, they've sinned against you, and they won't take your, uh, take your advice and, and turn back to the Lord, it says, then take two or three 
take one or two more, that by the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Again, the, the goal is restoration. And if they won't refuse, if they, if they refuse to hear them, then it says, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to hear the, hear the church, then you're supposed to expel them like a heathen or a tax collector. That pattern that I just described is the one Jesus gave because he wants us to have good connections. And if someone's living in sin, he wants us to go to them and, and try to help restore them. Tragically, that rarely happens. People get mad and what do they do? They break fellowship. I'm never going to that church again. They hurt my feelings. That pastor, he's, he, he's obnoxious or I don't like his style. I'm out of here. And, 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 and tragically, we let sin and, and Satan have his way and, and our, our, our influence is so diminished. Galatians 6.1 says, says something very similar when it says, if, if a man is overtaken in, in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You see, God wants us to love each other. He really does. So if you have a problem with someone in the church, what you, what you need to do is go to them and talk to them. What you must not do is go to people who had nothing to do with it and, and start filling their hearts and minds with negativity. In, in, in fact, whenever we talk to someone, we should probably ask ourselves three questions. Is what I'm saying necessary for them to hear? Is it gonna help them if they hear this? And, and why do I wanna tell them this? Often we use our mouths for things that, that other than edifying and building people up, we're, we're tearing people, people down and tearing things apart. You know, back in the second century, there was a Christian leader named Tertullian, and, and, and he, he, wrote the, he, he wrote about how the Roman government was disturbed about the early church. They, they didn't understand the church. They, were th they thought, these people are so strange, so unusual. So what they did is they sent spies into the church community so they could kind of gather reconnaissance. And, and, and they, they couldn't... Uh, they couldn't figure out their worship. They said these Christians sit in an empty room. They don't have a statue. They don't have an image. And, and they, they talk about this guy named Jesus who's not there, but they expect that he might return at any moment. And, 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 and then they said the thing that, that's so interesting too is they, they seem to love him so much and they really love each other. And that's what the spies said about Christians. Oh, how these people love each other. I wonder what would uh, what would happen if the government were to, decide, were to decide to send spies into our church today? What would they say? Would they be convinced that our faith is genuine because we were so loving and kind? Jesus said the manner of love that we're to give is to love as he loved us. How did Jesus love us? What did Jesus do to show his love? Wow. That, 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 that could be a topic all on its own, right? Left heaven, came to earth, was humiliated, mistreated, abused, tortured to death so we could be forgiven? Jesus experienced great pain. It cost Jesus to love us. And I think if we're going to follow Jesus, it's probably going to cost us to love each other. It's going to hurt at times. I, I, I read this about the founder of, of World Vision, a Christian relief agency. You, 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 maybe some of you even uh, give some support to World Vision. Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, had advanced leukemia, but he wanted to go see one of his uh, colleagues in Indonesia anyway, even though he was suffering from leukemia. And he, he went to this remote village, and as he was walking through the village, he, they saw a, a, a young woman lying on a bamboo mat next to a river, and she was dying. It was apparent she was not gonna live long. Well, Bob looked at this and he thought, this is terrible. What is this young woman doing out here in the open, dying? What, can't, we, can't we do something to help her? And, and, and they explained to Bob, they said, you know, Mr. Pierce, this is where she wants to be. She grew up in the jungle and she wanted to spend her last days next to the river because it comforted her heart. So even though there was a language barrier, barrier Mr. Pierce got down next to her and he, 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 he touched her and, and, and prayed over her. And then she started to talk. And, and Mr. Pierce said, what is she saying? 
And, and, and she said, if only I could sleep again. If only I could sleep again. She kept repeating that. And, and, and apparently her pain was so great that she couldn't even sleep anymore. Well, Bob knew, Bob knew about pain. In his coat pocket, he had a bottle of, of pain medication that he needed every day for him, his own pain. As he looked at that girl, he said to, said to the people that lived in that village, he said, take these pills and see that this girl gets a good night's sleep for as long as these pills will last. And he handed that bottle away. And for the next 10 days, Bob Pierce suffered leukemia pain because he was dying as well. But he knew that that, that girl needed some relief. And, and, and God infused that moment with his love and his grace. And I think it probably gave Bob Pierce a sense of just, I, I did the right thing by, by, by giving those pills away. And he, he loved that girl. And, 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 and that's what Christianity should be about, loving others. No, I'm not, I'm not implying we shouldn't take care of ourselves. I, but I am trying to tell you that following Christ will lead to a sacrifice. True love always costs. And, and, and where there's no cost, there's probably not real love. And Francis Schaeffer, who I quoted earlier, said this about modern Christians. He said, you know, our, our problem with, as Christians is not liberalism. Or, or modernism affecting the church or, or, or old institutional church traditions threatening us or communism or rationalism. And he went on and talked about postmodernism and materialism and consumerism. He had all kinds of isms. He said the dangers that are out there aren't really the threat. The threat to the body of Christ is this, that we lean on ourselves to try to do the work of God that can only be done in the power of the Spirit. And I'm telling you today, we can't be the kind of Christians God wants us to be without love. And we can't love unless God's grace and strength flows out of our lives. This is supernatural stuff. Our problem isn't the government. It's not the LGBTQ movement. Our problem isn't atheists or progressive Christians who are trying to remake our faith. Our problem is us. My problem is me. I try to do this in my own strength, and it doesn't work. And by this, Jesus said, all men will know you're my disciples, if you have love. Friends, we need to dig deeper. We need to really put our roots down in the, into the person and work of Christ. We will never love like God intended if we try to do it in our own strength. This world needs to see Jesus in these relationships. We need to be able to forgive each other the minute offenses that come up if God could forgive us as much as he's forgiven us. Well, thank you for bearing with me. This has been impactful to me to think about this this week, and I just felt like I wanted to share with you this most influential of all apologetics, to love one another. Heavenly Father, we want so much for people to know you're real. You've been real to us. And Lord, we want your love to be so real and so abundant in our lives. Help us to love better. Help us to get this right. Lord, in times like these, we need a Savior in our lives. Save us from ourselves. Save me from, from, from being uh, just, just somebody who goes through the motions. Help me to be a godly, passionate follower of Jesus. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today who's never put their trust in Christ, I pray that they'd realize that that a supernatural exchange can happen. They can give their sins to, to Christ and in, in exchange uh, by faith, they can receive his righteousness. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for us. And so, Lord, we turn to you. We thank you that you can rescue us not only from sin's penalty, the judgment of God, but you can rescue us from sin's power and from our, our fleshly nature. Help us to walk in love and help us to care about what you care about. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing number 272, Only Trust Him. 272, Only Trust Him. Every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give. By 
trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Thank you, Lord. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Verse 4. Come then and join this holy band and on to glory go to dwell in that celestial land where joys immortal flow. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Wyatt, would you close us in prayer? Thank you, brother.